Freedom is not free. Discover what it takes. It's time to tap and move forward. Hello and welcome to Tap and Move Forward. I'm your host, Lynn Shelley. I'm really excited for today's show for a number of reasons. First off, I have been looking for people who can really talk about navigating the mind. One of the most difficult challenges we face is learning to think effectively. It is most often our mind that gets in the way of us reaching our goals. And I have struggled to find anyone who can say much that really makes sense to me. This interview is very intense and a long discussion, but it is all actionable items you can do to understand and improve your mind. I'm also excited because Ed Earl is one of the most dynamic people I have ever met. I don't know anyone who has such diverse skill sets. He had a company rank on the Inc. 500 list three years in a row and has built other companies that also ranked. He has designed and built many products, like an FDA-approved sports drink, different firearms, a pickleball paddle, combatives knives, just to name a few. I love one of his recent projects that you can send in some fabric from an old uniform, and they will repurpose it into knife grips or a belt buckle. I'll include the link in the show notes if you're interested. He is just walking proof that it is amazing what you can do when you know how to leverage your mind. There is so much value in this interview, and like I said, I've done a lot of searching and researching on this topic, and I've never had anyone give me such powerful tools for success. It took me quite a few conversations with Ed to really get it, and to warn you, It really is quite long. Please don't try and force it. If you aren't getting it, listen to it in pieces or come back later. I ask a lot of questions and go into nuances. You don't necessarily need all of that right from the beginning. Don't overwhelm yourself. I sometimes get complaints that the interviews are too long, but I just keep asking questions if I'm still curious. So use what applies to you. For this episode's Warrior Challenge, Ed says it is all too often that people really don't know what we want to be and do. So his challenge to you is to keep a journal and write down the things that you are focusing on, spending time on, or that capture your attention. Then one by one, check them off to see if they are truly where your heart lies. If it is in your heart, it is something you love and something you love to think about. Where does your mind go when you are not required to think? Now the interview with Ed Earl. So, Ed Earl, I'm really excited to have you on the show. We recently had a conversation that I got really excited about because I feel like there's not enough people talking about really impactful things you can do and implement that really help your mindset. Right. And uh, you were talking about the part in your brain that is like the ex-wife. Yeah. Can you talk about that? Because I, I love the way that, that you yeah. see it. Yeah, sure. Hey, by the way, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate that. So here's the thing that happens, right? We, we talk about success and we talk about the mind. And there's so many authors that are out there. Mm-hmm. A lot of the information is fantastic and a lot of it is kind of a bunch of falsehoods that are over-promotional. I've never been a fan of books like The Secret, you know, things like that. And then there are individuals like a Joe Dispenza that talk about more significant things. And so for me, with a background in behavioral psychology, I've always found it easier to package up information in a way that people can grasp it. Because then if they can grasp it, they can use it. But when you, you put a 600-page book together about quantum physics, it's fascinating. It's just not actionable. And that's what I find. You kind of have the science on one side. It's not actionable. And then you have the candy psychology on the other side that's not actually helpful. And so I also find that for a lot of folks, they don't really implement this kind of stuff. So a lot of the authors that are out there, and they're not really examples of the things they're talking about. So you and I were talking about... <clears throat> how the mind works. And I was explaining that anytime that you're trying to intimate to yourself 
whether it's through self-talk or just thoughts, that you want to expand or what I call move the marker and you want to grow and progress to a different level, the way that the brain processes information is it goes, obviously travels first to the, to the thalamus area and the amygdala, which makes decisions that are based on lots of things, but let's just boil it down to a couple, things that are familiar and connected to you, things that are disconnected and disjointed or odd, and things that are threatening or dangerous, right? And that's the filter for, so to speak, the hard drive in your mind. So anytime that you're trying to be successful and you say, I'm going to be X, technically what you're doing is you're personally intimating to yourself, you're going to be something. The problem with that thought is it goes into that and it says, well, there, are there any things in there that are familiar and connected to them being this kind of person? Do they have a history of that level of discipline, that level of thought pattern, that level of activity, that those associations, things like that? And the answer is no. So then it votes and says, ah, that's, uh, let's veto that. And then it sends it out through the cognitive network of the brain to run the cognitive functions, which we now know obviously is on a left or a right anyway. All that stuff happens throughout the, the whole entire neural network. And so what happens is, is when the, the cognitive function of the brain, since your mind is a creature of, of efficiency, it basically says, well, if this side or this part of the, of the functions of the brain said this was a no, here's the problem. 85% of the time, whatever the thalamus and the amygdala and those processes come up with, the cognitive functions of the brain will go along with. So here's the thing you have to realize. You can't outrace your mind. So when we were talking about that, I said, think of it like this. Anybody that's been in a bad relationship and they've got an ex, whether that's an ex-girlfriend or boyfriend or an ex-husband or an ex-wife, let's say that individual knows you well, knows your, your inner thoughts, your activities, and then you're out there in the dating world trying to purport and intimate a certain perspective to other people. And then you meet someone, and I was relating this to myself and saying, let's say I meet a girl and I say, hey, I'm this kind of a person, let's go out. The problem with that is this whole process of how the mind works would be no different than her knowing my ex-wife and saying, well, okay, let's go call her, right? Let's see what she has to say about Ed. Well, that's not going to be good, right? <laughs> There's not one thing that's gonna be good out of that. And then look at what happens. Anytime I go out to try to take a step forward, that relationship prospectively with someone else is always going to initially come back to the ex-wife. She's gonna blow that up. So that's kind of really what's happening. Every time that you try to intimate a different level of success for yourself, it's as if, right, that person, that success level follows up to your ex-wife and says, well, hey, how is this person really? Oh, got lazy, doesn't do anything, never follows up on what they say. They quit after three days at the gym, you know, whatever that is. And there's no way to get past that. You've got to short circuit that and hack that ability for that individual to contact your ex, i.e. you've got to find a way to hack that in your brain because it will, you'll always lose to it, always. Right. I, well, and I have experience with that. Yeah, I know. So do I. <laughs> when, when you're describing it, and even the first time that I heard you describe it, I got really excited because it's like, oh my gosh, somebody really understands. Like, right. I know exactly what you're talking about. And there's so many people out there that talk about positive affirmations and how you just yeah. like bombard yourself with these positive affirmations. But I, I feel worse if I try to shove a positive affirmation down my mental throat, you know, right. like, yeah. and that, and I, I, that piece in me is really strong because I, I'll try and figure something out and then I'll know how it doesn't work. And then I'll sabotage it on purpose because I know how it doesn't work. Yeah, your mind will do that. That really is the, the whole reason why they always would say, why do women end up in bad continued relationships? Or why do any, why does anybody? continually do the same things. It's because your mind knows you better than your cognitive mind knows yourself. And so since that information, anytime you try to, like I said, intimate something to yourself that you want to be further than you really are, your brain just goes, yeah, no, not going to happen. And then the cognitive function goes, well, they know, like they're the ones with all the data. So I don't know why I'm going to even process this. 
It's so genius. Right? The guy's <laughs> already guilty. We already have it. Why do you want me to open an investigation? Oh. Do you know how much resources that takes? Yes. And, and then I... your brain goes, now shut it down. He's already guilty. Leave him in jail. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're not we're not going to override this and, and open a case and start a new trial. Do you know how much re you like go back to your 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 TV shows, right, with the FBI and they're like, do you know how much resources you just committed to this investigation? You need to think about that, right? The mind is a creature of efficiency and goes, they're already guilty, they're already in jail. We're not doing it. <laughs> it's not worth my time. Yeah. And this is before you even get to Taking a step, you can't or, do anything. Right, it's already the decision's made. You've already decided you you can you're failing yeah. before you even take the first step. You you don't and even you get, may even choose to take the first step, but you're doing it being like, oh, I'm a failure. <laughs> and what that's like is that's like you getting the date because the ex-wife hasn't called her back yet, and then you're like, oh, we went to coffee a couple times, and then the ex-wife goes, hey, sorry, I've been in. <laughs> I've been out of town. I just got your message. Yeah, he's an a-hole. Right? It's almost like the ex-wife showing up on that day. Oh, that's even, But yeah. being at the next table and being like, you know, no, no. Like, anytime you say something, she's on the back table being like, nope, nope, nope. nope that's not true. That's not true. Yep. So, so throughout the date, so you're like, yeah, I got the date. I'm going on the date. But you're sitting there with the, the ex-wife there. No being, matter how they, no matter where the ex-wife ends everything. up getting involved, so to speak, ex-boyfriend, ex-husband, whatever, you know, whatever right. we want to use. The fact is, is you can't outrace the amygdala. You can't do it. And since the mind is a creature of efficiency, the cognitive functions literally go, why am I going to spend resources on that when we already know, right? And there's no emotion attached to it. It's just going, no, you, they're, they're not that person. There's emotion on the other side. On the other right? side. On the cognitive side. Yeah. Because then we, we might even pout and be like, well, how do I feel I about that? <laughs> yeah, and then, but in the end, in the end, it really is just a very efficient way. And that's why we talk about things like training and doing stuff like that, because you have to create a scenario where you have that um, functionality that's built in. So your initial responses are in your favor. And so that's part right. of the thing that happens. It's just very difficult, if not almost impossible, for people to overcome that. Right. And so there's two sides well, to that. On mistake, it's almost oh, sure. impossible. Yeah, on absolutely. Mistake. And so that's part of the thing that happens is, is that it, you see guys that, that overcome and you ask, how did we do that? And you look at the gargantuan effort. Yeah. It's just self-discipline and something inside of them finally switches, which yeah. nobody ever gets the ability or has the ability to seemingly explain why that happens. And I'm not saying this interview is about that as much as I'm saying you see these gargantuan efforts. And then at the same time, once people get to a certain level of success, it just seems to be that everything that they touch, they just keep right. pushing through that because they have significantly adjusted, moved the marker, changed, and everything that's inside the thalamus and the amygdala is, has shifted. So the things that are familiar and connected to them are indomitable spirit, right? That never quit attitude, waking up and feeling fired up. They've created all these new things, right? Inside that, that functionality of the brain. And so they just seem to do it easily. But the problem is, is that getting there is a function of activity, and then it's a function of, of, of brain activity. You, it's so difficult to bypass, right, the X, that you have to find a way to dis, kind of diffuse that bomb, or all those bombs, Right. and, and that's what's important. You have to work on, on both, otherwise you really are at the mercy of what's already in there. And if you didn't install all that stuff, right, which most of us, didn't, didn't. Right. we get that from our upbringing sure. we always talk about the i always say there's only you're only born with two fears right the the fear of of, of falling and the fear of loud noises and everything else you're 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 programmed. you learn you're programmed yeah it's your environment and so that being said look at all the look at all the bombs that are inside of our lives that we have to find a way to to diffuse those and hack them otherwise we're at the mercy of all of that and that's why it takes such a huge gargantuan effort. But if you can work on the activity side and the brain activity side, then all of a sudden you can squash that time. And that's not, that's not, I'm not saying the law of attraction, 
There's a value to that, but we won't get into that quantum physics mentality. But I'm saying actionable things that you can do because trying to take those gargantuan actions, we're not motivated generally to do it. So you've got to find things that you can do that are actionable that don't require you feeling like Rocky Balboa, right? You can't, you, you can't be there most of the days. Right. You're just not going to be there motivated. Right. So Well, it's, it's kind of like going back to the previous example with the ex-wife and, and the way that most of people that I've heard talk about it are what they're saying is almost like you have to smother the, the ex-wife or, you know, like try to completely negate the ex-wife. But the irony... Pay her off and bribe her. <laughs> pay her off and bribe her. The irony is that whether you're taking attention away or you're trying to bombard or override with energy, it makes her stronger. Like yeah. that's been my experience at yeah. least. It, that part of the brain just, it like feeds off of energy one way or another. Well, and anytime you intimate to yourself and then you're, you're, those functions of the brain go, no, you're not. You've literally stacked another brick against you. Right. <laughs> it's like you're, you're building the monster. You're feeding the monster the whole time. Yeah. So sometimes it's it's a little easier. And I like I said, I'm not saying that these are the the the, the law of attraction. There's a value to that. I think 99% of the people talking about it completely misunderstand how it works and they completely misunderstand how to get it to work in your favor. You know, this isn't a karma thing. Right? This isn't just a vibration and energy thing. All that crap starts right there in your brain. Your brain, you know, you look at guys, one of the things that, that people ask all the time, how, for me, how do you create so much success in so many things? It, it doesn't matter what it is. You go into an area, you touch it, and it's like, bang, there it is. How does that even happen? It's because the way that my mind, what it, how it works functionally, is that it has those levels of success and processes that are, quote, familiar and connected. So anytime I look at something, my brain just instantaneously breaks it down, innovates it, fixes, fixes it, and then builds a whole entire success map for it. It happens instantaneously instead of other people's minds that see something, they don't even recognize it, right? And so since they don't even recognize it, it literally is just sitting right underneath their nose. They don't even, they don't even realize that the, the key to their wealth is right in front of their face, right? Because they, their, their amygdala doesn't even pick it up, all right? So they don't even recognize it, let alone have processes. So if they even recognize an opportunity, right, the ex-wife goes, yeah, he's an idiot. He'll never do it. Don't, don't give that guy an idea. He's just going to blow it up, right? Yeah. So now all of a sudden, you don't have that. So once that gets shifted, obviously, going forward, and there's ways to do that. It's just not what most people think it is. Okay, so so what what can somebody do? What are actionable? Okay, so here's here's one, and and I'm and and here's the thing that happens, right? So you like I said, you talk about the law of attraction, you talk about stuff like that, but it all starts here in the mind. And so without going through like the whole process of the Genesis point and some of these other things I talked about, which are more advanced levels, let's just talk about one thing that flips it over. I really dislike the word hack. I don't like it. It's become a buzzword. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, is 99.9% .9 of the stuff that we claim are hacks are just us figuring something out that has been there the whole time. <laughs> Nobody invented a principle of the universe, right? We just evolved enough to go, oh, there it is. I get it, right? And so it's not really a hack. It's it's a function of repositioning the way that you talk to yourself. So that way it's not you intimating to yourself, right? Hey, I'm going to be X. And then that whole process kicks in and kills it. So you have to shift it out. So there's a lot of things to do, but here's one that I do. Fortunately, a long time ago, this is, geez, I don't know, I'm 52 now, so this was back when I was 22 years of age. And, and I was being kind of becoming my, winding my way up as an entrepreneur. And I had a lot of, a lot of time driving all over Dallas, Fort Worth. And I'd be in the car for two, three hours a day, going back to meetings, clients, things like that. And so one of the things that I would do is I would do interviews. And I would, as I drove down the road, I would 
do, I would run the meetings, literally dialogue them, and I would run interviews. And so I would act and role play as if Inc. Magazine, which later I had features in Inc. Magazine for years, and I would say, okay, here's an author, and I would have a list of questions that I would make that were related to my future success. And then as I did that, I would ask the question, so Ed, what is it like to be that young and be that successful at the age of your early 20s and dealing with men who are 50 and 60 years of age? How do you deal with them, that, that discrepancy where they would look at you as a little kid? Right? Say that would be one of the questions. Well, I would verbalize that. And I would say, hey, Bob, thanks for you know, giving me an opportunity to, to have this interview. I really appreciate it. Here's one of the things I've noticed. And then I would dialogue all that out as if I was in an actual interview, radio, for a newspaper, for whatever, a TV show. And so, so you're like actually sitting alone in a room? I could be alone in a room. I could be in the shower. I could be doing it um, you know, while I'm lying in bed, listening to a little bit of kind of meditative music and I'm role playing that or while I'm driving down the road or while I'm going for a walk. I do it all the time. And so when I would do that, I would keep adding those questions and here's the thing that happens, all right? When I'm doing that, you are in a situation where you are actually not intimating to yourself, I'm going to be successful. So your brain isn't even looking at that dialogue going, yeah, he sucks. It, you don't even get there. You've literally short-circuited the X to right. not even in the picture because you're not intimating anything. In a, a roundabout way, it's almost like flattering her into supporting you. Yeah. So it's it's an interesting thing. So now you're having this interview. And as I did that, what happened was I had to come up with answers. Because here's the facts. People who are successful are experts at their particular you know, category mm -hmm. of success and many other things. Experts get interviews. Experts end up in magazines, newspapers, radio shows, TV shows. That's, a, that's an understandable, logical transition that's in our brain, right? Our amygdala and thalamus already knows that experts end up on the news. They know that, right? Because look around us. So that's a common piece of knowledge. So instead of trying to intimate to myself, I am this, and our amygdala and thalamus area goes, no, you're not. I'm going to put myself in an interview that is technically a side piece of understanding that our amygdala goes, oh yeah, interviews, I'm familiar with that. But it has nothing to do with me being successful, which kicks it out. It's just an interview. And that gets it. So when I started doing that, the better I became at answering those questions, no ums, no uhs, no brain freezes, the right words, a little bigger vocabulary, with passion, with cadence, right? More oratory. And I could hear that. If I would record it, I could hear it and go, that sounds really good. See, I'm not necessarily intimating to myself to be successful. I get to sit back and look at that and go, man, that sounds really good. You see what I mean? I've pulled that apart so it's not technically me that's saying to myself, hey, you're going to be rich. It was me doing an interview. And the better I became at that, then what would happen is, is my mind would shift because when I was giving those interviews and I was so good at them, my brain goes, wow, that guy's an expert. See, I want to catch the brain off guard, not by telling him, I'm coming. Here I come. Wham. And then it just knocks me out. I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to hijack him. Because now the brain's listening to that and going, wow, that guy really is smart. Because the interviews were eloquent. They were linear. They were sharp. There was no rambling. They were specific. They addressed the questions, the demeanor. All of that was right. And when the brain looks at that and says, wow, that guy's an expert. Well, look what I just did. I made the brain look at that and go, like you said, admire. Wow, that guy's really good. I didn't know that. Now, all of a sudden, that shifts in your mind to where you are now an expert. And as soon as that happens, now look what happens to your filter. If you are now an expert that is successful, 
Now, everything that you look at, your brain goes out and says, I go out and find 24 hours a day things that are familiar and connected to me, things that are disjointed, things that are threatening or dangerous. That's why wealthy people stay wealthy, because all those scams are threatening and dangerous to their wealth. So it kicks them out automatically, right? We don't even look at them. We know they're stupid. But things that are familiar and connected, if I'm now an expert in my mind, because my mind went, wow, that guy's really good. Well, now look what happens. 24 hours a day, my brain's going, let's find things that are uh, connected to Ed being an expert. Let's get, find things. So that's the, the level that you're talking about with the, the law of attraction. Yeah, and now it changes. It changes everything that we look at, and it changes every decision. It flavors every decision, because now I'm an expert. Experts don't get up in the morning and go, I don't want to go to work. Experts don't do that. Experts don't go, oh, I don't really feel like working out today. I don't feel like eating that broccoli and chicken one more day. Experts don't do that. But, but until you shift that and make it familiar and connected, your brain's got nothing to, to draw from. One of the things you commented on that I think is really important, but I, I, I'd like you to go a little more sure. in depth, is the type of questions that you're right. asking. Because I, there's, there's a, a tone to questions that can... There is different responses. And there's a lot of things that happen. For example, I would talk about, I would list questions. And by the way, in the beginning, I just started asking questions that I had potentially read in other interviews, hmm. right? So I just list, oh, here's that. What was your biggest, what was your biggest failure? What was your biggest, now that's a, an amazing question because you have to realize your mind already knows all your what? Failures. All your failures. Yeah. So when you say in that interview, what were your biggest failures? Now you have an ability to address them, right? You can address them like, well, one of my biggest failures was this. And what I learned from that was this, and then I implemented this, even if you haven't, right? You see the difference? You're just asking, you're answering a question instead of saying, no, I'm this kind of person. You're not doing that. And so you can take questions that position you the way that you want to be positioned. You can ask questions about your future success. Hey, what, what was the first car you bought? What was the first reward you bought to yourself for yourself, Ed, when you, when you became uh, a millionaire? And I said, when I got the check and it came and it kicked us over the top, it was my son's birthday. And, and this is a literal thing. It was my son's birthday, and we had rented out the entire skating rink for just us. You know, you had money. Just rent the whole freaking place out. Who cares what it cost? I said, but then we got the we got the check in the mail, and then we knew that's what was going on. So I left before that thing started, and I rushed down to Dallas Gold and Silver, and I bought the Rolex that I wanted. And then I got a ticket haul tail and ass all the way back before I was late, right? And I told that, I would tell a story something like that. Just fabricate it. So this, okay, this is all created. Oh, it's all created. That didn't, that's, that wasn't even, it, but it did end up saying. happening like that. It did? Yeah, it happened to, oh, basically almost exactly like, like that. That's such, that's so detailed. Well, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So that's. But, but there's one of the things though that you didn't necessarily say, but what I heard in your story there's pieces of it that make it more humanistic or real. Why do we believe half of the stuff that we believe? Because we see it on TV with such detail and such emotion and such graphic illustration with music and everything else, right? Your mind is a creature that wants specificity, mm -hmm. right? We can lie in generalities. Platitudes and generalities roll off the human understanding like water from a duck's back. They leave no impression whatsoever. So specificity is what makes it stick. So you create the stories. And so that was part of the questioning, the positioning, the rewards. See, things that I dreamed about. Hey, what was it like buying your first house? Oh, yeah, that was crazy. Right? And I'm talking just like I'm talking right now. Like how that sounds is exactly what it sounded when I was living in a crappy two-bedroom house. Right? It was exactly the same. And I'd say, man, Bob, that was crazy. And I would tell the story. Now, did it happen exactly that same way? No, but I would tell the story as best with all the details. Right? And then other things I would do is I would add questions 
that would have to do with things like issues that I was struggling with, discipline type things. So for example, now I have a whole list of questions for my fitness, right? And I would say, and actually I came up with a whole different bunch of stuff today just on motivation alone. And I would, in my fitness thing, I would say, I would add questions like, so what do you do when you get up and you know you need to work out fasted, but you've got, you don't either A, want to do it because you're not motivated or B, you feel totally motivated towards the projects you're working on. So you want to just bypass the workout and get to the work, you know, the business work because the agency is growing. So I would ask that question. What do you do, Ed, when that happens? And I would literally interview that out. And I'll tell you what, in the beginning, I didn't have a great answer for it. So I would just work through it over and over. And then if I had to, I'd come back and write it all out. And then I would rehearse it. And then I'd say, okay, now let's do the interview again. And we just keep doing it. And so that's how I do it. Today, one of the major, I woke up, I was not motivated to do anything. Like literally not motivated. I could have drank five rock stars or my Zeus light. I wouldn't have been motivated. I wasn't motivated. And so I kept going, what do you do? And when you're just, and so I was in the shower and I go, what do you do when you're just not motivated and you've tried all the stuff on your list that motivates you? And I made the comment in the interview, I said, you know, that's a, a great question because it really is, I'm feeling that way right now. And I said, but one of the things you do is, is everything that you, that motivates you, is that really everything that motivates you? I said, what I had to do is I had to go back and start making a list of all the things that make me excited. And I'll be honest, it didn't, it wasn't a one day thing. I didn't sit down with a notepad and just scribble it out. There was a lot, I had to really start paying attention to stuff that got my, my dopamine levels up because I needed to change that state. And I started making a list. And so I started doing that. So when I came down, I, I turned on the music. And, and a Nickelback song came on. I know everybody's going to hate me for that, right? <laughs> and uh, anyway, and I heard it and I was like, dude, this pop sugar candy rock, it makes me smile, right? <laughs> like I'm smiling now. So I went, oh, you know what? I'm going into the studio in the other room and I'm going to play drums. And when you showed up, I was playing. Mm -hmm. So I was doing that and I was singing. And all of a sudden, within minutes Oh, this rush of dopamine, this rush of excitement, this rush of passion came back. So I am adding that to my list of things that change that state. I went through all my, you know, Tony Robbins power slap. I went through my, it's going to be great. I went through everything, man. None of it worked. So in the interview, when I was in the shower and the steam, I said, you have to sit back and really pay attention to the things that pop those dopamine levels. And then when you do that, make those, let, write those down. And then I have to bring this interview question back into an interview. So that way I can cement that. So my brain goes, oh, Ed, you're not feeling motivated. Do this. Pop, 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 pop. And just mentally go through the checklist. Because if the stuff is in there, then your brain will go, no, 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 no. Yeah, go play drums. And so that was part of the interview. I do that to over, I add interview questions that help me overcome the, the lack of discipline that I might have in a particular area of my life so I can overcome all those things and I do it in an interview. So once again, it diffuses those bombs and then my brain, when I get to talk about it at a level of expertise, my brain goes, man, that guy's an expert at overcoming state problems. So it's not just that you reach expert level one day. It's almost like a recurring desire you're diffusing or every single you're trying to find yeah. whatever piece you can that you're learning to be an expert in something new the thing that holds us back from like we talk about one of the things i love uh, about guys like a david goggins or, or athletes is that their levels of success are documented in the sense that they have super achievements that that you can see mm -hmm. and and it and they can document th what they did to get there in business, you can document that stuff too, but a lot of times there's so many more dynamics because there's so many other things involved. And so I love that with athletics, but what happens is, is when you start doing this, you don't realize what you could achieve because you've got so many bombs, right? You've got so many bombs in there. And so you, every time you go in with this interview process, what ends up happening is anytime you go in there and you start going, oh man, I had struggled with that. 
you write it down in the form of a question, you do an interview, and then you know what's going to happen? You're going to sit there asking yourself the interview question, and then you go to answer it, and you're going to go, I don't have a clue, man. I don't even know what to say. Or you're going to ramble around and go, yep, sound like an idiot, until you get to the point where you can speak it eloquently, with specificity, with detail, with outcome, as if you were, that this person was interviewing because you were an expert on that subject. Until you get to that point, then you'll never overcome it. Once you get to that stage, even dialoguing it in this interview process, the brain will go, wow, that guy really knows what he's talking about when it comes to and then it'll shift. And then it'll shift. And if you keep doing that through every area of your life, in, and this is just one of the things. I mean, there, there's bigger things than this. This is just one, one hack for me. If you keep doing that, then you'll start pulling all those bombs out of your life and you're literally moving the marker. That's part of what Move the Marker, my book Move the Marker is about that I'm writing right now. And, and this is a, a very significant, actionable thing that anybody can technically do without a level of expertise. You know what I mean? That That's what I needed. I didn't need to have a... a a discussion on quantum physics as it relates to the law of attraction. I didn't want to deep dive into the actual psychology of how everything, I can do that. That's my background. I just don't want to do it because people don't, follow. They, they don't follow. You know, yeah. when I teach kids tennis, I say, hey, I want you to do Dracula. And then when we do it and we get on the court and go, <laughs> you know, all the kids are like, and they're slamming balls all over the place and we're having a gas to the monster mash, right? They get that. But if I explain the law of physics to them, <sighs> You know, everybody gets lost. It's also much more playful, which it's is more, more engaging. Yeah, yeah, more fun. You can and, and people get it. Like, look at the kinds of conversations in your life or the kinds of things in your life that you could ask questions around. Like, I know you're doing this, right? Sure. So what were some of the things that you were putting in your interview? Well, I've noticed that kind of the way that I've learned to pose questions um, and where they're kind of an element of flattery that's attached to it. Sure. Those are the ones that I usually notice a, a real immediate change in the energy that is going on inside of me and inside of my brain. Right. And so I, I tend to, <laughs> I tend to be like, wow, it's, you know, a lot of people are struggling with this. Like how in the world are you getting over now that's that's interesting, right? Because you talk about an amount of flattery, and if you notice, like all my questions, why do you why would you start with something like that? Well, part of it's because if someone is technically interviewing you, there's a reason why you're being interviewed because you've achieved a certain level of success. So there is a certain amount of flattery that's even positioned in the actual interview concept, right? Somebody interviews David Goggins, there's flattery yes. from the for the second. So everything has to be positioned like that, you know, like you said, man, everybody's struggling, but you've been able to do this. And yeah. how did you even get to that point? Yeah. Okay. So keep going. That's interesting. <laughs> um, one of the things that I think is really important that I'd like you to talk about a little bit more that I, I've kind of tried to talk to friends with about this a little bit, but I've noticed that it can be really easy for people to think that they need to come up with both sides. It's like their imagination fills in both roles. Right. Where the their conscious mind is almost standing in front or trying to stand in front of the ex-wife, you know? Yeah. When, yeah, sure. And you you told me that we almost need to treat our minds as if it was someone or something separate from us. Yes, it's not you asking you questions. Yes. You need to role play the interviewer. So you find in whatever magazine, like I used to do it in Nick Magazine and all these other things, and I would find the main guys. Oh, I did interviews with as Rush Limbaugh all the time. And I'd say, hey, Rush, thanks for asking. I really appreciate that. I appreciate it. But by the way, I was on the Rush Limbaugh show quite a bit uh, for a while. So here, so let's go. Top interview questions. 15 remarkable interview questions. You can literally pull stuff like this off of the internet. And when you do it, you, you interview yourself and you role play another person. And you simply say, hey, Ed, we really appreciate you taking the time to 
talk to us at Inc. 500. Obviously, this article is going to be about this, and you position it all. And and we really are amazed at the success that you've achieved at such a young age. And one of the things, and this would be like me role playing this guy, and I would say, you know, the fact that you became a multimillionaire at the age of thirty, while having at the time four or five children, and then six later on. How was that even possible? Because I heard you say in one of the videos I watched of you that you, business was always fourth on the list when it came to priority. So how does someone achieve something that significant and get an Inc. 500 company three years in a row at such a young age when they had all of these other you know, quasi liabilities attached to them? That We find that just kind of mind blowing, right? That would be the question. Well, hey, Bob, thanks for having me. I really appreciate the time. You know, I'm honored to, obviously, and with Inc. Magazine, because, we, you know, we did rank the company three years in a row. And then I would go through there. And I said, yeah, you're right. I've always said that these things are the most important to me. Business was always fourth. You'll see that in all my videos. Because I want people to understand that whole concept that Stephen Covey talked about with the big rocks. And I wanted to illustrate, you'll find that for me, I'll never talk to you about something that I am not an absolute example of ever. I have an expertise problem. So you'll do it in your head, mm -hmm. but then when it comes to real world, yeah. you're very careful about what you talk about. Absolutely. I only talk about things that I am an actual expert on. And so that's how I would do that interview. And because like I said, I'm pretending and role playing. And by the way, I'm doing this all out loud. I don't do this in my mind. I do it out loud. Everybody drives down the road and listens to the radio. Never. I haven't really put the radio on in my car for 35 years. Because you do interviews? You do internal interviews? Radio while doesn't you're make in me rich. In the car? Radio doesn't make me successful. It's all these jackasses that are singing pop candy songs that every moron on the planet listens to. Now, when I'm listening to the mu when I'm listening to music, I'm in the studio playing drums. I, I have an issue with just dorking around. If I'm going to go dork around and mess around, I'm going to actually do something, right? So it doesn't mean I'm not leisure, but even when I, even when I watch TV, action movies, I've got a laser gun out and I'm dry firing and doing crap like that. I just can't help it. And, and so for me, entertainment, I, I, I love achievement. So anything that's entertaining for me is in alignment with achievement. Right, because that's I get my kicks off of that. I know that my my dopamine when I sat down and said, "What are the most important things to me?" and I started writing that kind of stuff out. I mean, this is this is I have a zillion of these notebooks. I fill one up every other month, and I start working through that stuff and go, "What's the most important to me?" The number one thing, maybe it's in the other white one. I'm writing two at the same time. It's taking all the things that I see and putting them into re making, turning them into reality. It's my pursuance of my creativity from the stuff that I see in my brain into actual things that are real. I'm, I don't care as much about the money. I have so many products that I never brought to market. I'll, I'll, I'll build a product just for myself. I mean, literally go through the manufacturing of the whole entire thing and cost 10, 20, $30,000 to manufacture something that there's three of. Why? Because it's my idea. That's what I get off on the most. And so if I understand that, which I, I do, that that's what gets my kicks, then I just keep going everywhere I go and go, uh, I don't like that. I'll fix it. That could be better. That could be better. That could be better. Now, I, I don't mean, you know, like Jeff Bezos level of stuff. I don't have any desire to, to do something like that. I, I like my freedom way, 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 way too much than to be like chained to a corporation. And so that's kind of what happens. So I run those interviews like that. And, and Lynn, that's also how I get into other spaces and other markets. All the things that I've ever created, which are now coming over 142 patents, in doing that, I start doing interviews. So Ed, what was it like to come out of nowhere and walk into an industry and then all of a sudden be the master content creator for the largest magazine company in the world? And then being an author when you didn't technically have a law enforcement military background? I'm like, yeah, that's really a, a great question. It's kind of funny, Bob, is that uh, I actually cold called the largest magazine in the world. I said, but I had a process for that. 
And I said, so what I did is I took my camera and I took my video skills and graphic design skills and business skills and I went around to all of the best guys in the world, combatives, blades, firearms, and I started making content for them because I knew that they they didn't have the money to pay for that stuff at $1,000 a produced minute. They didn't have people. I lent my expertise to those guys free of charge. And with that, I made them money, helped create more success, and gained a lot of clout with those individuals. Then I took all those relationships for, for 18 months that I created, and then I went to the magazine and said, and literally cold called them, and I have all of this stuff screenshot, and I still have it up, and I said, hey, I don't know if this is of interest to you, but, so I, I literally waited for an opportunity. And the opportunity presented itself when a competing magazine talked crap and basically made a homophobic comment on social media, all platforms, against one of the most decorated combat vets in the world that they made movies about. Okay, And so I, I went, that's it. There's the gap. And this is literally how I'd answer that in that interview. And I said, here's what I did at Cold Call. I said, would you be interested if I brought the Doug Markaitis, the Fred Monsters, the this guy, the this guy, the this guy, to your team. And they went, heck yes. Next thing you know, I was signing a master content contributor contract. And then two months after that, we were filming for the majority of all the firearms companies and, and blade companies. And then I ended up being an author in the magazine from zero. So how did a guy with no background in any of this stuff become the number one guy? Right? And so I would... I would interview that. So if I had a strategy in my brain that I wanted to really push forward, I would ask a question like that and I would answer the interview question with that strategy like that. Even though it wasn't even, if it wasn't even real, it didn't matter. I'd keep answering it until what? Until it sounded right in my head. Does that make sense? And I would even evolve the strategy over and over again until I did it. And then that's how I do that stuff. I'm so, future speaking in the end. So you're basically, yeah, you're future speaking as if it's now. If, if it's now. And then, and you're, you're almost writing stories, like creating stories. Oh, to the detail. And then, they, but, and experiencing it, I'm assuming, because like, as you're, as you're speaking it, I'm, I'm the great, I'm the greatest it. actor that doesn't, that's not on screen. For yourself. Yeah, because I'm completely convincing to my brain. I'm Eddie Murphy in this whole entire thing. And that's really thing, what's what the whole the whole thing is is you have to be yeah because convincing listen, enough to your brain. listen to how I explain it right. I'll even go yeah, and the guy even said to me <laughs> blah blah, and I was like oh yeah, well that that's the way. I'll literally do it as if it already happened, and then the mind's gone. The emotions there, the dialogue's there, the humor's there, the specificity is man. This guy's good at this stuff. He's an expert. And it believes it. But you have to put on a show. You have to put on a show. You can't just say, I'm going to be rich. <laughs> because your mind's like, no, you're not. You're a loser. <laughs> you're a bum. It's not going to happen. So I put on a show. I put on a show. And then the brain goes, when they hear when the brain hears it, it goes, wow, that guy's really good. That guy's really, really good. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, they... That, that goes into the familiar and connected phase, and that instantaneously changes the way you see the world. It's literally like I took you and completely create, right? It's Remember those those pictures that all the paintings, all the weird things in it, and then it was like, find the shark. Oh, yeah. Remember? The magic eye right, ones. Right, the magic eye ones. There's a trick to that, right? It's to blur. It's to stare at it to where it blurs just enough. Right. Okay? Well, that's, that's the way that it works. Like, guys, we used to train on a lot of different levels, but we used to train um, professionals, European professionals on putting. And we would talk about how to figure out where the line in the green was, like however it curved, sometimes like heavy curves. And I would say, why? I said, well, first thing, when you kneel down, get down a little low, and then I want you to just look at the cup, look at where your, your the ball is, look at it, just stay there. And then what I want you to do is do the same thing like you do in the magic eye. Heavily stare till it blurs everything out. Then what will happen is the line will show up. Why? Because any type of undulation in the green will be exposed by when they cut the green, the different levels will have slight variations in the grass. Slight. Slight variations in the grass. And so what happens is 
when that happens, the slight variation in the grass, you'll see the little tiny distinction between the lighter and the little bit darker grass in the line. But you'll never see it unless you do it like that. And then people look at that and go, really? You can, you can do that? I'm like, yeah. Right? It's the same thing. So one person seems like they can putt and it's magic. And other people go, I don't have the foggiest clue where this stupid ball is going to go. Right? Well, that's what happens. When you shift that, all of a sudden, you look at everything and it's, you can see the path that fast. And then your mind goes, well, he's already successful. So all of a sudden, you start acting. The way that your mind responds to everything is different. I mean, that's really all it is. Discipline isn't about doing it over and over and over and over again. Discipline is about what you think. Some people are raised with discipline, right? So they have it. Some people just can't do it, right? And look at the gargantuan efforts they have to go through. But if you could just go in and go diffuse, 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 right? And people talk about that. That's not some new concept. I just think that they're full of crap the way that they talk about how to fix it. That's my biggest issue. Most, of, most people in this industry make money by talking about it. They're actors, right? They're the guys on the screen acting like they're SEAL team guys. You couldn't shoot a gun to save their God-given life, right? Acting like they're martial artists, don't know anything about it. Acting like they're FBI agents, don't know a thing about it, right? That's the problem with most, I think, with most of the guys in the industry. They're talking about it, but they don't technically do it. And that's why you never see anything that's legitimately actionable. So what's the difference between the person who's acting like it's real in real life and you acting like it's real in your head? Because I'm not, I am not acting like it's real. I am positioning myself aside from kind of my mental hard drive. In real world, you're not acting like it's real. No. No, well, for me... There's guys that are out there, like the old, like I say, the old Charles Givens of the world, where these guys were saying, here's wealth without risk, here's all the seminars. And then when they deep dived him, they realized this guy doesn't do any of this stuff. Like he's never made a penny doing any of these things he's telling other people to do. He made all his money on the books and the tapes. Now, is there value to that? Sure, because those strategies were 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 good. And a lot of people did a lot of really good things with that. He was a messenger, but to act like he was this guy way up here, when he didn't do any of it, I can't abide stuff like that. I don't like it. So anytime that I'm talking to you about stuff, it's because I'm an example of those things, right? I'm doing it. If I talk about putting, I'll actually go out and, and do it. If I'm talking about tennis, I'll go out and do it. And people that know me watch me constantly manufacturing and designing things and anything under the sun. It's just all day long, right? If I'm going to say to somebody, here's my marketing strategy for building a company that I want to teach to you, I actually am following and eating my own dog food and following. I'm an example of that. You know, that's why I always have a hard time with a lot of guys that are out there that are saying, hey, what would you do with a million dollars with a business advice? We'll come over here and we'll do X. You're like, dude, you didn't build your business. You have this whole entire group of people that built your business. You had a whole bunch of people that liked your message and put a bunch of money in it to push it because they knew they could make a billion dollars doing that and you're the dancing bear. That's fine. But let's take you out of all of that and then say, okay, go here. Now let's start with something new. Now go. See, they can't do it. And that's the problem I always have. When guys are, one of the things I've noticed about people that are successful in business in business, not successful like a speaker or that kind of stuff. I mean successful in actual business, right? Where there's hard assets, right? The, all the functionality and operations of a, of a normal business. Those people seem to have an ability to just keep being successful at everything that they touch, mm -hmm. right? What I find is, is most of the guys that are out there talking about success, they are not successful in any other business besides that. It's because they don't conduct business. It's just not the same thing. They don't have vendor relationships. They don't have liability attached to structures and the technology that runs all that stuff. They, they don't deal with any of that, right? So in the end, they're, it doesn't mean that they're not a business. It's just that they're one kind of a business, right? You can't take a guy's in the entertainment business and all of a sudden say, well, let's go run a machine shop. For guys that are successful in business, they could do basically any of those things.
we could uh, boil that back down into the military structure and look at the people that seem to be very successful in any aspect of the military or the ones that get into the highest, most tactical aspects of the military are there because they learn how to adapt mm -hmm. and how to be successful in any given situation. And they have to, on some level, they have to learn a mental game of being willing to be comfortable and confident no matter what challenge is arising. Yeah. And it's essentially the same type of, of concept. Well, in the military, you're very results oriented. You know, the you're either right or they're dead. The, the consequences are severe. Yeah. Here, if we're wrong, we lose money. We go bankrupt. We lose some relationships, but nobody dies. And so in that format, I'm, and I don't know throughout the military how, how accurate this is, but it would appear to me, seem to me at the highest levels, that you have to be willing to look at the result that you're trying to achieve and within the rules of engagement um, have the ability to adapt to anything that creates the result. And in business, it's very much that way. There's a lot of things that what I find, and I say this all the time, in that you'll see all these lists. What are the top 10 problems that business owners have? What are the top five thing problems that business owners have in business? I, I don't like that list. And the reason why is because here's the reality for business people generally. The biggest problems that business people have in business is everything. If you're a plumber, you have a problem with everything except for the plumbing aspect of the business. If you're a contract, you have a problem with everything but the contract. If you're an accountant, you have a problem with everything but the accounting. You're, you're technically a talent. You're a basketball player. You don't own the team. You don't own the stadium. You don't own the concessions, the janitorial company, the parking companies, the security companies, the promotion companies, right? The TV, the radio, the media, the platforms that distribute it. You don't own any of that. You're just a guy that plays basketball. The problem is, is if ultimate levels of success, you've got to have the ability to be open and willing enough to adapt whatever strategies that impact each of those areas. And I find that most business people are not willing to do that. Right. Well, I think it comes down to the same thing. It's like the, our visions or perspectives of ourselves are, are too limiting. Yeah. We, we believe too little of ourselves or what we're capable of. When you can interview, that's why I like this interview format, because you can hack all of that and interview that out of yourself. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly. why guys ask me, they go, why don't you, why didn't you build bigger things? And I said, I had no desire. And, they, what? and I said, no, don't misunderstand. It doesn't mean I can't. And it doesn't mean that I don't have the talent. I can go in and, and manage a company. I just don't want to do it. It's not because I can't do it. I've done it. I just don't want to do it. You know, it's just not something that I want to do. In the end, there's this big filter that I have called to what end, right? To me, it's to what end. I'm a, a single digit golfer. Can I go win a club champion if I sp spent a little time on the course? Yes. Why? To what end? Who cares? Right? I'm still a 5.560 player. Could I go out and win all the state championships and go on a senior type tour? Sure. To what end? Right? Do, does my company, my partner and I coach people into the top 250, top 200 on, on the tour in tennis? Yes. So let's go be a tennis coach and travel 40 weeks out of the year. To what end? Right, make 250, half a million dollars a year, be gone all the time, hang out with spoiled bratty, Tennis kids, right? To what end? It's not, a, when you get to a certain point where you know how to diffuse all these bombs and you eliminate your limiters, then you know you can go to as high as you want. Now you have to say, is the juice worth the squeeze? It's not because you can't do it. It's because you have to say, to what end? Right, I'm a professional level pickleball player. Why would I wanna go play tournaments? Because most people who are unaccomplished would look at that and say, well, that doesn't make any sense. If you were that good, you'd go win. To what end? What do I win? Ooh, a trophy. Wow. The notoriety of a bunch of well, douchebags I don't even care to about. To me, I just hear that that's not your fight. I could right? care less. You and, yeah. the, and I think everybody has their own version of what their fight is. And maybe for Agreed. someone it is the pickleball I agree. Tournament. But when you 
when you push your stuff that's low level of a fight and you push it to here on somebody else, then you're then people have a hard time grasping that, right? It's it's like I talk about competition shooting. I shot for a while. I didn't enjoy it. It was boring. I'm a high level shooter. I could reach tops if I wanted to. To what end? I talked to the number four shooter in the world one time and I said, have you ever won any money? He goes, Ed, number four shooter in the world. Good friend of mine, Craig Alston. And I said, have you ever made any money? He goes, I've never honestly paid a house payment with anything that I've ever won in 20 years of shooting. It's a hobby. You're right. And it's a hobby. So for me to spend that much time on the road for a hobby that amounts to nothing except for self-gratification, then you have to decide. So for me, I want to make bigger impacts. So I spend my time doing things that create more impact. I don't care about a trophy for me that I put on a wall. I got all the trophies I can stand. My version of a trophy is different. My version of a trophy is the manufacturing of something that doesn't exist. I don't care about a, a, a guy, a fake plastic guy with a tennis racket on a marble base. I don't, who cares about that, right? And that's the thing I'm saying. When you get to a certain point, you have to evolve. When you know how to start pulling all those limiters out, then all the blinders are off of you, Lynn, and then you can see what you're really supposed to accomplish. And I can assure you, I know so many people that are insanely talented. And at the end, they walk away and they've got some trophies. That's, that's what we ought to be focused on. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm saying it's, I think we could we could do a little more than that. Yeah. Right? And that's kind of the issue is that when you start looking at who you really are and the impact that you could actually really have, then all of a sudden it starts to change what you're doing as far as an activity and it puts things in into a radically different perspective. But I think people don't get that because that self-indulgence gratifies them and they, they need it. But once you eliminate all that, you don't need it. Right? That's the ultimate form of freedom when you don't care. You, you'd commented before we did this. We were talking about not being beholden to anything. I don't care what anybody thinks. It literally doesn't matter to me. I mean, I do to a degree based on certain people, but I'm saying in the end, I'm not governed by, I'm governed by what I, my own compass. And nobody is pushing on that because I've eliminated the majority of that junk from my life. And so therefore, I can see some things a lot more clear and focus on things to me that are more about who I really am. And I think most people don't know that because they haven't pulled away. They right. haven't diffused enough of those bombs. Think about it, right? If, if you knew that in every area of your life you had an ex, and every time you went out there, she was like, yeah, guy's a moron. He's a jerk. Don't get involved with him. If you knew that, doesn't that change where you walk, how you walk, what you say, how you say it, how you dress, right? All of a sudden, you've adjusted. your. It doesn't mean you're not going about doing normal things. It just means it's adjusted every single thing that you do because of all those types of things. Once you start moving that, you don't know how to walk through this life the way you're supposed to. You don't know how to walk through this life who you are because you have all of those bombs you haven't diffused. You have all those X's in those areas of your life that you have not eliminated from your life. So you really don't know what it's like to walk completely free. That doesn't mean you're free of bills. That doesn't mean you're free of this. It means you're free of everything else to be exactly who you're supposed to you're be. You're free of the bombs. You're free of the bombs. You can run out in the park like a little kid trying to grab Easter eggs. <laughs> right? Just as many as you can fit in the basket. Yeah. <laughs> as fast as you can before the other kid gets them. I can't help but think of um, Rose Namajunas. Oh, yeah. I'm a Love really her. big fan. <laughs> um, but if you know about her story, she really didn't have a real happy, like, oh, yeah. privileged childhood. But and early on in her career, she she even talks about how she would fight angry and how she was dangerous mm -hmm. that way. But she's much more dangerous when she can be more like a cat and calm and smooth. It's more zen. But she also talked about how when she first got in, she didn't know that she really cared about the getting the title. But then she realized how difficult it would be to get there, and she knew that it would be. A journey of discovery yeah. of herself and herself as a champion and as a fighter and then she decided 
that she wanted it. But it wasn't, the funny thing is it wasn't the title, it was the... The journey. Is what, the, is what it took and to it, get the title. Exa- and when she first got it, the, she even said it's not really about the belt. Like, this is, this is all entertainment, mm-hmm. but really there's a lot more that we can do and a bigger impact that we can have. Yeah, and she, ans- she and, answered her to what end. Yeah. Right? What does it make of me to exactly. win a pickleball championship? Not a damn thing. <laughs> when for Rose Namajunas, like uh, she's she's known for being emotional and yeah. going through like before she got in the ring, she, sometimes she would break down and mm-hmm. she would cry, and she would have like this emotional. I think there were bombs, right? Yeah. It oh, was absolutely. Each time before she went into the ring, it was like she had to diffuse that bomb, yeah. and and the way that she knew how was to express and to feel the emotion and to let it go before she walked in. Yeah, well, think about success. When I when I first started trying to be successful, I was doing it in spite, despite people that said I couldn't. Ed, you don't have a college degree, you quit college in the in the first year. You can't go and be a business guy. There's no way. Nobody's going to. You're too young, Ed. If you don't have a degree and you're 22, these 45, 55, 65 year old men aren't going to respect you, right? You don't have a degree. They won't respect you because of that. You don't even have marketing. Ed, that that industry doesn't even exist. There's no such thing as that title you're talking about. It doesn't even, it's not even a thing. And, and so people would say all that stuff and, oh, oh, yeah, but you're a loser. Oh, yeah, but you're this. But look how broke you are. Look at all these types of things. And I would do it because I was pissed. And then as I began to evolve, I did it for the love of the creativity. I did it for the love of the people. And people asked me one time, um, they said, why do you do the stuff that you do in business that you, that you create better content that helps the big, the good businesses rise above the competition. I said, here's why. I said, because it's a mission for me. And they went, how could doing that be a mission and not be about the money? I said, let me explain. It is about the money, just not in the way that you think of it. So I told them a story about this guy who was a good, good friend of mine. They had six kids like we did at, the, at that particular time. And he left his job and became a consultant in the, in the technology business, technology industry. And he was doing well, got to a point where they're starting to make money, couldn't get insurance because, you know, solo individual self-employed insurance is really high, but they had got to a point where they'd put enough money away. They'd been stacking enough money, they were renting, ready to buy a house, I don't know, $10,000, $20,000. Got into an accident. Just something stupid, slipped, fell, bam, ripped his knee to shreds, took the majority of all of that money to pay for the surgery and some of the rehab. And I thought, oh, okay, not a big deal, right? Then he's healing, and but his car breaks down. They've got a ton of kids. They got a suburban. It breaks down. They need to fix. It. The guy's got to get back and forth to work. There's just no other way around it. They go to the mechanic, best one that they could think of back then. You know, all these types of things, Yelp reviews, all that. That didn't exist, right? You just go to the yellow pages, try to talk to somebody. You know. Anyway, spent twenty five hundred dollars. Fixes it, week later, breaks down. Guy's like, well, sorry. Now this guy is flat out freaking broke. And he's screwed. And I'm the whole and I'm telling people, don't you understand? The biggest problem is, is the the jackass mechanic looked exactly the same as the good mechanic. He couldn't, through the marketing and the advertising, tell the difference. How is that possible? That's why I do what I do. Because if I got a hold of the good mechanic and I fixed his stuff, this guy would have a car that functions and he wouldn't be in the poorhouse. So I took his family to the the dealership and I bought him a car and wrote a check for it. Okay? And so people wonder, why did you do what you do? Because people get screwed. And it could be their last a bit money because nobody can tell the difference between the sucky companies and the good companies. And there's a big, it's still that way, right? And so in doing that, people, and that, that's why I do what I do. That's why I'm so passionate about that kind of stuff because I know what it's like to be the guy on the other end that can't tell the difference and then he gets rooked. You know, it, 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 it screws people up. It makes major Im- impacts in their life. 
And people don't realize that. Why? It was just a mechanic. No, it's not. Not to that guy. Right? It's that whole starfish thrower mentality, right? How can you possibly think you'll make a difference with all these starfish? He goes, well, I did for that one. There's a version. Like that stuff, there's some people, they read that stuff and it sticks in their mind and then they make their life about that kind of stuff. Right, doing that kind of thing. And I think that that's not most people. I think it's a great thought, but they've got too many bombs in their brain that they don't ever get to the point where that kind of goes, you make their life and the things that they do about creating bigger impacts, right? Because we're always, we, we still have to solve that we don't feel good about ourselves. Right, exactly. Because you really can't, you really won't take any action that's any meaningful action. It really is. When, a... you, when you don't feel like, there's anywhere you can go without stepping yeah. on some sort of minefield. There really is a there really is an uh, re- there really is a, a reality to the if you don't love yourself you can't love other people. So you extend that out and 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 if you're sitting there being hampered by all these bombs, i.e., also your ex telling everything, and you you can't technically ever legitimately feel that way about yourself because everything in your brain is saying there, he's a bad guy, she's a bad girl. She's not worth it. She's good. She'll screw you over. Blah, 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 blah. He's not worth the loser. Like all that stuff is in there. So how do you ever get to the point where you can truly, that's why people ask me about my relationship with my wife and I go, you have to understand the kind of person you have to be in order to, to have that kind of a relationship. It's not luck, right? It, it's not luck. You have to be an extremely evolved human being to have that kind of a relationship. And have that kind of relationship having gone through the insane amounts of trials that we've been through, not to mention a blended family of 10 children, right? We're sitting at the top of the list of insanity when it comes to marriage and family, right? So to make this thing work like a, doesn't mean there's not issues here or there, but to make it work in such a high level way, that's a function of evolution, of evolving as a person. It's not luck. Well, you when you you talk about bombs, you're not saying that in you start practicing this and all of a sudden you won't find any more bombs. Oh no, like, you'll keep finding bombs. The, the point is to be more effective and to learn how to be stronger as you find them. The hack and the interview hack, which is just one of a zillion things for me. The interview hack is just a way to diffuse all those things. Right. And a way to like you said, turn your ex into your wingman. Yeah. Right? Instead of your nemesis, now all of a sudden it's your wingman. Right. And then every time that you find something like that, then you stick that into your interview process and you find answers to it until you become an expert at the dialogue. So you do that with yourself and then Mm -hmm. like you're talking about now in real life with your wife now, you're still going to find bombs. Like anytime you put two people that close together, uh, ob- there's obviously things that are going to come up. You're yeah. going to find your own bombs as you work together. Well, plus with Deb and but I, then it's a, but then it becomes an actual interview, right? Right. And they, well, you interview yourself out of that. How do you feel about this? How do you feel about that? And and then so you do that. So what do I do? Instead of saying, I, I have a lot of different interview processes for my marriage. Okay. First of all, I don't really have any significant issues anyway. And so they're not even issues like that. It's just certain other types of circumstances that come up and you start going, I would say from a success point, I would say something like, so Ed, here's, here's something that I want to ask you because 85% of all young entrepreneurs for the age of 30 end up getting divorced. How did you avoid that, first of all? And then secondly, when you create this type of a blended family, because I know you got divorced, how do you deal with building a big company with that much liability? And I'll say, yeah, you know, that's really, Steve, a great question. And, and I'll be honest, and I'll throw little things in there, you know. It's tough being successful with a family because you have to really, I know everybody's out there and you think about it, it is liability. Meaning not liability in a negative sense, but liability based on the fact that it takes time. There's all these other dynamics that you have to deal with and, and the reality is, is it, it comes down to a couple things and one of them is leadership, right? The family is, if you're the true father and we're in, in, in our home, it's not a patriarchal society, we really govern together but you have to be on the same page. Obviously people tell you that. And so I'll go through all this stuff and then I'll bring up experiences and I'll bring up all kinds of things and I'll answer them in the interview in a way that I probably based it, because this is future talk, Mm. how I want to deal with that stuff that I'm not quite there yet, right? How do you deal with that when 
And here's one of the questions I, I had asked all the time. You and your wife, neither of you work. You don't have jobs. So you're together basically 24-7 unless you're on a trip. How, do you, how are you around someone like that so much? I, I'm married and I couldn't be around my wife that much, let alone work together because that never works to work together. And then I'll say, yeah, that's a great question. And I'll be honest, we've, we've really been successful at it. But there's a couple of reasons. And I'll just talk about it. And if one of them is, how do you get past the point sometimes where you get frustrated? Like one of them for me is, I'm now in, Deb sees me now in a CEO mode. And she's actually doing some of the work. So there's a quasi CEO employee relationship, right, that's happening that's also a marriage relationship and a best friend relationship. So I talk about that. But I'm not because I'm having struggles, because I'm trying, I want to get ahead of any potential thing that I see. Does that make sense? So now I'm not even diffusing a bomb right in front. I'm starting to go, okay, there's going to be bombs out there. Let's diffuse that. Hmm. Something that I Before I'm even experiencing it. When you're, when you're talking about this, for someone who maybe isn't married, but wants to have a discussion with themselves like their future self is married. Yeah. Would it be dangerous for them to try and put a label on who that is? No, not necessarily. Because, for example, I was divorced and I wasn't married for five or six plus years. So I would have those conversations, those interviews. How did you end up finding the woman of your dreams and how did you know? And what do you say to people that don't believe in soulmates? And then I would just dialogue that kind of stuff as best as I had the ability to do it. And here's the thing, even if you're creating with passion and specificity and detail a a circumstance, it's not because you're trying to make that come true. Like, he's gonna appear in a certain way and and look at me and be completely captivated and (laughs) run to me and grab me and go, where have you been all my life? I'm I'm not saying that. That's, that's delusional, yeah. right? But you're saying certain things. And what you need to do is you need to do it in such a way that it's, it's you're answering the question in such a way that's got specificity and detail with passion and, and the, but normalcy based on what happens in, in life. Yeah. And I would say, yeah, well, one of the things that happened is some, you know, and I'll bring up a story as if it happened. And so when you do that, will it show up exactly that same way? No. But what you're trying to do is get your mind to go, man, that guy really knows what he's talking about. It doesn't matter if it shows up like that, right? It's just getting to the point. And sometimes you may have to research something to where you can have an answer. Because the first time you ask yourself a question, you're not going to have a good answer for it. Your brain's going to go, get this guy off the air. (laughs) This guy's an idiot. Time out. Go to commercial, right? That's what's going to happen. Because your brain's literally going to, to blow up. So you have to sometimes research that and build things around it. And and so there's elements to that that you have to do. And then here's the reality. If you are delusional to a degree, well, that's a whole different ballgame, right? You have to be a quasi right-thinking person because you can interview yourself into being more delusional. Yes. Yes. And I can even see that the way that you're talking about it, I can even see that there's places where when people are talking about Um, the law of attraction and how you visualize things and blah, blah, blah. You know, I can see how when I was like, I'll try it out, that I was really going into a space of delusion rather than Money's just going to fall out of the sky. (laughs) Oh, I did this meditative YouTube, blah, blah, blah. And the next day I got a job for a million dollars. No, you didn't. Shut up. Yeah. You're still the same jackass. Even if you got the job, you'll probably lose it in 30 days. You hear those stories. Yeah, it's all bull crap. (laughs) It's all BS because everybody wants to intimate that it worked for them so they can validate themselves of why they took the time to listen to this damn thing every single night for three hours. And after six months, they're still poor. It's really just a way that they're trying to negate or overthrow the Mm ex-wife instead of turning into turning her into a fan. You got to realize the ex-wife and metaphorically speaking, the ex-wife is metaphorical. She's always going to win. Yeah. She's always going to win. You got to turn her into a wingman. And once that happens, the mind goes, you know, because imagine I, I know people like that, you know, where people, I I know people that have been married, got divorced and they're best friends. They're best friends. And, and my cousin, her ex-husband introduced her to her current husband. They've been married for 20 years and they're still friends. 
And he would tell him, man, Jules is just an amazing human being. You'll freaking love her. Well, why are you married to her? I kind of had some issues. And the reality is, it's just, we got married young and it didn't, she was going one way. I was going a different way when we didn't get together, but we're, we're buddies. Next thing you know, like that, her new husband and the ex-husband, anytime they need to talk about the kids or whatever the deal is, man, they can have conversation, go have a beer and it's all good. You know, there are, it doesn't happen very often, but there are things like that. You have to get the brain to say on the outside, not that's the problem. You can't intimate to yourself because you'll, that's how it gets involved. And your brain's just going to go, no, you're not. So you do this on the side with this one little hack. And then once you get to the point where you can legitimately with specificity and creativity and an expert level of dialogue, the brain will go, wow, she really, he really knows her stuff. Man, and as soon as that happens, chick, bomb diffused, everything changes, and the way that you look at that kind of circumstance flips. That's the actual law of attraction, right? It's, it's really just in the brain. It has nothing to do with vibrations. and I, I mean, it does to a degree, but in reality, it still has to be fixed here because this is what's, if you believe in vibrations, whatever you're sending out there can't come from any place but here. Right. Hence, if you believe in that, if you have bombs in there and the ex-wife is in there telling everybody you're a loser, then you're just going to keep vibrationally attracting that kind of loser stuff to yourself. So the minute it flips in here, so if you believe in vibrations and you believe in that kind of stuff, as it's maybe even potentially more scientifically illustrated in quantum physics, well, then that's great. But you still have to fix it here. And nobody seems to talk about that with actionable stuff that anybody can do. And like I said, if you're, if you're delusional and you've got some distortions, then you need to go potentially fix that uh, with some therapy, right? Because it, you got to be halfway clear thinking, right? You have to, because your mind will go, that's delusional. Like the, it knows it, right? It knows it. That's why it's in there. It's just really your delusions are really like really delusional X, X's in your brain going, yeah. <laughs> no, psycho. Right, but you can fix it. And when that happens, this is just one way to pull yourself aside from yourself, not intimate yourself to, in, to enact that process in the brain, but to pull yourself aside and work through it. And if you do it, the brain will look at yourself, look at that and go, wow, that guy's really good. Or wow, that girl's really good. Man, that's sharp. Whoa, that's a good answer. And then all of a sudden it goes, you know what? We need to, we need to, we need to correct. The results. This is what I'm trying to say. You have to think about this. The mind does not like, this is my, kind of my last big thing on this subject. The mind does not like inaccuracies to the positive or to the negative. If you're trying to be positively here and your brain knows that you're not, it will correct that instantaneously. I win a million dollars. You're a loser. You'll lose a million dollars. You'll spend it. You'll throw it away. You'll Bobby Brown it. I mean, you just piss all that money away. It doesn't matter what it is. You will self-sabotage. But on the other side, if you flip that switch and your brain goes, wow, she's really sharp. Gee, she's good at this. The brain will look around and go, well, if she's really good at this, how come she doesn't have any money? <laughs> I need to fix that. Yeah. And it will automatically go, there's money, there's money, there's money, there's money, there's money. The brain will fix it instantly. That's the actual law of attraction. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, and, absolutely. And it's not, it's not sitting down and listening to meditative music or trying to meditate and, and visualize certain things and all of a sudden this money falls from the sky. You know, some guy doesn't show up like Bagger Vance and hand you a bag of money. Like that's not how it works. And so it really is that. And then the brain will automatically correct the deficiency. Period. And that's how it works. And, and, and when I lost money, and then I had to come back, I installed a bunch of bombs in my brain. I did them. Purposefully. Purposefully because I wasn't able to live at that time with my ex-wife trying to hold my family together. I couldn't live and survive with that environment with her unless I put ki those kinds of bombs in me. So I downregulated myself, I downgraded myself. Well, let me tell you something, man purposefully installing bombs in yourself, when you do that cognitively, you will F your life up and it will be the hardest freaking thing you ever come back from, if you even can. 
It's one thing to have somebody do it to you and you don't recognize it. And it's compounding because the bombs that were there, like we talk about, you know, I was in a situation where women were treated a certain way or it was a very high patriarchal type format. And so in the end, my relationships caught me in these circumstances. That's one thing. But if you cognitively put a bomb inside yourself, do you realize the depth of what your brain does? Your brain looks at that and goes, this person literally is killing me. You are committing suicide. Coming back from that is almost impossible for people. I know because it took me years to get those bombs out of here. And you want to know there's one of the biggest ways I did it? Interviewing. I had, and it was hard. It took years to interview that out because every time, what it was is I would go, okay, I'm going to build something. And then the bomb I installed was, you can't, uh, you can't be more successful because it makes me want to kill myself. That was my ex. So I installed that bomb. This was real world. Yeah, real world. This is real world. So any freaking time I started to get wealthy again, I might as well have made somebody commit suicide. My brain can't, as a moral human being, the way that I am, is my high-minded morals, dude, I couldn't even abide that. So, my, turmoil, shut it down, 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 shut it down. Because I cognitively installed those bombs. I cognitively placed them. And I remember the day it happened, so I cognitively did it. Because I knew after a certain conversation with her, I can't be me because she can't, she can't deal with it and I can't dissolve this marriage. We have six kids, right? She'll just get through it. We'll work through it. And I remember the day I did it. I committed emotional suicide. I remember that day specifically. I remember the actions. I remember specifically what I did and I remember shutting myself down. I remember downregulating myself on purpose. So it's, a, it, it's so significantly dangerous to install cognitively those bombs. So you have to be careful. The, the, uh, and I just tell people all the time, when you get into a circumstance where you see that that's what you need to do, you better get the hell out of that situation. I don't care if it's a marriage. I don't care if it's a, a boyfriend, girlfriend. I don't care if it's your kids. I don't care if it's your job. You run like the freaking wind because you have a chance to escape, right? So in doing that, you just remember that that's kind of what, what ends up happening is that if you downregulate like that, if you install that cognitively, it's it's worse than anything else that's ever been put inside of there that you've quote adopted right does that make sense and and people don't realize when they're doing it because you have to realize it's because you're up here at a certain level and then you say i am cognitively going to create this circumstance and then when you try to get out of that your brain doesn't just blow up a bomb i mean it's the whole structure's coming down every time so it's not just an IED that blows up a little this or that or the other and diffuses something or messes something up or keeps you from a certain thing. The whole thing comes down. It blows the whole structure up. You're basically placing bombs on all the footholds and the whole hospital comes down on you and kills everything inside of it. It's the most self-destructive thing to cognitively do that to yourself. And so when I tell guys that, that when it comes to success, you have to realize that on the negative side, the brain will adjust that to that and just destroy it. If you fix it and diffuse it, turn the, the, the crazy X into a wingman and a raving fan, well then it'll correct, the mind will go about correcting that discrepancy to the positive side. And that's really what it, what it boils down to. It's just, this is one technique that I use, that I've used since I was 22 years of age. And I've used it in every single area I've ever been in, whether it's fitness, uh, nutraceutical development, I have an FDA approved product, it's the only one on the market of its kind, to firearms, small arms development for military and law enforcement, to blades, to ever, like literally everything I've ever done. I go into that industry and in that stuff I find out and I start joining the interview and all the places where I don't have answers, I start developing all the answers and developing the stories and doing this stuff until my brain goes, man, that guy's good. Right, and then all of a sudden, 
Yeah, I'll design blades all day long. I'll design firearms all day long. I'll design these components all day long. Oh, body armor, a new version of this. Why isn't it? And then I ask myself all the time, why am I the guy doing this? Like, I am not qualified to do this. You're right. I'm not qualified experientially based on what? Military, law enforcement, whatever the deal is. But I'm way more qualified here in the mind. Does that make sense? Yeah. Way more qualified. No, it does. Because I think uh, there's a fair amount that we go through life thinking that this is what we're quote unquote supposed to be doing, like socially acceptable norms rather than what we can or what we want to do. And oftentimes you find the disruptors or the people who are doing crazy things, amazing things. They're usually the ones that are not necessarily the ones that are supposed to be. Yeah. The majority, the majority of all innovation is created by outsiders. I talk about that in my new book, Get Clout, where it comes from and the whole concept of the diffusion of innovations and everything that happens in that, it's almost always without exception from outsiders. It's just the nature of the, of the deal. You know, it's like you said, it's because people have, they have their own minefields and they're operating that industry. The military is infamous for it, right? They're infamous for, well, it hasn't been used in three world wars, that, that's crap. You just see guys in the military and law enforcement just argue all day long. And then the competition shooters go out and make it all famous. And then all of a sudden, a couple of influencers in law enforcement or the military go, oh, yeah, hey, optics are pretty good. Now, all of a sudden, it's like, yeah, optics are amazing. You suck. And you're like, no, dude, you've been saying optics suck for the last 20 years. Now that they're popular, now you're on board telling everybody else they suck. Yeah. Every industry has a version of that, right? And so that's kind of what that's kind of what happens. And so for me, it's all about the mental process. And so when you go through that and you understand knowledge chunking and you understand like the stuff I talk about with uh, with um, my mastery platform, when you understand that, you walk into an industry, you know through the interview process what bombs you need to defuse. Mm -hmm. You also know that there are certain levels of knowledge that create the expertise. So you just go about doing both of those things simultaneously and start grabbing them and then eliminating everything. But when you think clearly, right, it's a lot easier to go, okay, that's crap. That's good. Those things are garbage. That's good. Those things are garbage. That's good. Oh, that's crap. That's good. That's good. That's good. Okay. Take all that. That's not bad. Let's take all that, put it in here. Now, now that I've got that, I've eliminated 99.9% of the stuff out there. I take that and I come over here and then I do that. And then all of a sudden, because I can do that and I can talk to experts and I know what I'm looking at, I can, within a month, grab everything I need, bring it over here and then go to work. Whereas everybody else will just sit there forever and create. And it's stuff that, that should be there, you know, but it just doesn't because of all the, all the limiters. So that's kind of my thing. Once people get to a point where they're living their life without those limitations, and then they know that they can defuse all those bombs and, and, and turn that turn those kind of crazy X's into, into wingmen and raving fans. Then all of a sudden, you know, to use that terminology, raving fans, all of a sudden you not only are living a more free life, you know that anytime there's something that comes up, you know you have the skill and the process to get through it. So your brain doesn't go, hey, crap, that's a problem. See what I mean? Right. Then you, your brain goes, no, pff, this, this, guy, this guy's been through five billion things. He just, whap, easy. It knows that you know because you become an expert at what? Diffusing bombs, turning psycho X's metaphorically into raving fans and wingmen. It knows that. So now you never perceive anything as what? An obstacle. Right. Ever. Uh <clears throat> I did an, a different interview with um, a, um, with Dave Acosta. That's yeah, great a, guy. That's a um, an actor shooter expert, and he was talking about how if you don't ever think about the situation of what you would do, then that's when it actually happens. You totally black out. You're just you you just stand there. They're, sh they're showing that shooters have an incredible accuracy rate. Yeah, 42%. And he's like, it's because they're not moving. They're not going anywhere. They have better accuracy than the police law enforcement that are trained in, in weapons. And why would that be? Yeah. And it's because people are going into this state of 
they just don't know what to do. These they are freeze. ways that I can respond, yes. They freeze because their OODA loop doesn't ever cycle. It just sits there. And that's part of the amygdala. That's part of the thalmosary, right? That's, a, that's that emotional response based on the hard drive, right? You're not 50% as good as you train. You are, but part of the problem is, is you're 50, if you don't train, then you're 50% as good as I suck and do nothing. 50% of zero is still zero, Yeah. right? A million times zero is zero. So the reality is you're right. You, you completely freeze because that's the fight, flight, or freeze, which is all governed by the same thing, connected and familiar, disconnected, disjointed, or odd, and then threatening or dangerous. If people are trained, that's, that's situational awareness, right? The, 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 the mind is out there searching for those three categories all the time and goes, um, that's not good, right? That's above the baseline. Right, that's, that's above the baseline. We don't have to live in a heightened state of awareness. We just need to put that stuff in there so we, we know to be addressed. That's, that's not, right. that's a little off, right? You know what's above the baseline and these people don't know that. And so you're right, you freeze and your OODA loop never spins, it never catches up. But I up. think that that's true in, in all of these bombs because mm-hmm. your bomb basically is an area you've been avoiding. Like you don't want to look at it, you don't, wanna def- you don't know how to diffuse it, so you have been avoiding it, you don't want it to go off, so you, but, so it's like this just space that you don't want to think about. You might build a structure all around it. Yeah. Just to, don't go there. Right. But then you're not, then if a situation comes up that deals with what's behind there, then you've got the bomb, so instead you just, you freeze. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why you take all these things in your life and one by one, And then you start interviewing your yourself through those things until you can get to the point where you are and you could do this in firearms training right you just do the interview so what was like what was it like ed you you got into a situation when this happened and and i will do this when i play a game with myself which is what happens when someone comes in and whatever the circumstance is, you're eating lunch, you're on the deal, somebody's driving, trying to mow people over with a moving truck, anything that's current, like a bank situation, things like that. Um, I'll go in and I'll talk to my cop buddies, talk about a bunch of things, and then I will sit down and do an interview as if I was in Ballistic Magazine. Say, Ed, you've had quite an interesting experience as a civilian being in quite a number of actual gunfights. You know, one of the things I read about you is that you had this situation. How did, that un- how did that actually unfold and how did you know to respond like that? Well, then I just tell the story as if it happened, right? One of the things that happened is I, I could, you know, you pay attention and you're aware and then down the road I hear this guy gunning at night, people are starting to scream. Well, as soon as people are screaming, I already know where the screaming's come, coming from. So my initial reaction was to pull my sling bag around to make sure and cinch it so that the body armor was up front and I pulled my Glock out and put it in a position where I could move towards the towards the 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 altercation and what was happening. And then I positioned myself in such a way that I wasn't in the line of this truck. So I positioned myself more across the street. And as he was coming towards me, I was kind of diagonally coming from across the street so I could get to the point where I could start firing. So by the time he passed me, I was firing directly into the cab. And I said, so that's what I did. I made that instantaneous move so I could dissect him. And so in the end, when he got to a certain point, when he was probably about 30, 40 feet away, I started lighting him up. And basically just as fast as I could press the trigger. And that's where good platform, good press, good grip come into play. So that gun's not flying all over the place. I can can see why movies almost don't have the same draw after you've spent so much time in the... See, when I'm talking about that, doesn't it sound like it actually really happened? Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. It's never happened to me. Absolutely. (laughs) It's never happened to me. But I can tell the story in the interview that it happened. And then if I say, then I say, well, and then here was the other thing that happened. In, in, In part of it, the gun jammed because I have such a high grip on the Glock that I actually engaged, I actually engaged the slide lock. And so I literally had to tap rack and and go after it and keep running. And I said, now here's the thing. Once the guy was down, my buddies were already calling 911. And one of my buddies went to the car, got the the SBR and his and and ran it to me. And so by the time that was done, I holstered my Glock 19 and then I started covering everything with, uh, with 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 a bigger gun, with a rifle, a short barreled rifle. 
And that's when we started doing things. Now we had to prep who was Mo. We started pulling the jump kit out and started ministering care to people that were there, making sure that everybody knew what was going on, trying to just see, you know, get everybody who was in there potentially videoing so we would have witnesses. We broke all that down. And then we had to wait when the cops came. We had to make sure that everybody knew that we were there and we weren't the bad guys. So we I had guys go to the, the entrances on the on both sides and say, listen, when the cops come, wave them down and say, my buddy's up there. Here's what we've done. He's taken out the, the main shooter. We don't think there's anybody else. We're administering care and then bring the cops in to me so I don't end up getting shot by law enforcement. So that's kind of how it all went down. And a lot of that had to do with training that we had done for all the last couple of years and, and kind of rolling through this stuff. And so in the end, it, you don't really think about it. It just kind of happens. And fortunately, fortunately this time it went in our favor because that thing obviously could go radically sideways. Right. And so I've told that story a thousand times. Can't you tell? Right. A thousand <laughs> in your, times. In your head. You've... Like this while I'm driving down the road doing an interview. Yeah. Why? Because remember that time when people in France and other things were mowing people over on the sidewalk with, with trucks. Just when you think, oh, nobody would ever do that. Why would you need a rifle in your car for that? So when that happened, I play this game and I interview it. I don't meditate. What would I do? See myself? No. I need all of the input that you can potentially gather up on your side. When you tell a story, your brain will believe it. See, and I get that because I know what it's like to lie to my parents that I got a B in math and then all of a sudden, three months later, get my report card and have it be a D and I was surprised. <laughs> I'm like, how the hell did that happen, right? I thought you said you got a B, Ed. I don't know, Dad, this is complete. I was convinced that I had a B because I had told the story with such color, with such passion, with such descriptive about the homework that I did. I had done it. I'm really good at lying to myself like that, okay? I'm good at creating stories because I've done it so much, right? Anybody can do it. We all do it. But if I do it and, and I use verbal, that creates the visual. But it, my, I, my, my mouth is doing this, my ears are hearing it. My brain is seeing it. I'm feeling it. Now I've got all five senses working on that story instead of, I'm going to be rich. I'm going to be rich. See, and now I have a descriptive thing and the brain goes, man, that guy's good at that stuff. Man, if you ever want a guy to, to, to have a gun on him, when crap goes down, it's that guy. Right? That's how it works. Well, Ed, it has absolutely been a pleasure having you on the show and i i can't tell you how much i appreciate this this content in particular is something that i've been looking for for a long time and it is definitely the key type of information that i really want to get to those rising ranks yeah it's actionable and i appreciate you doing the interview it's uh helpful to me to talk about it because i don't talk about it a lot Oh, that's unfortunate. <laughs> yeah, I have More a people need to know. <laughs> I have a different viewpoint on a lot of things like that, and I find that true that most of the guys that are very good at these kinds of things are guys that do them for their own success. They're not there to talk about them and become famous for that kind of dialogue. It's it's really they're more executors of the stuff. And I think that's where most of the gold is, right? Guys that are that are like me and like my associates that are very successful and dynamic at what they do they use these techniques or things that they figured out to accomplish that, but it's not their design to be out in the public eye trying to become a motivational speaker or things like that. I, I don't know, maybe I should, I don't really have a clue. That's why money motivates you. People will say that to me all the time. You're a motivational speaker. And I'm like, I ah, know I'm not. I help people make money and become successful. It's the money that motivates them, right? But the fact is, is that this is the kind of information that people can do. They can, it's actionable. Anybody can do it. I don't care who you are. You don't have to be motivated to do it. You can just toy with it or do what I call explore. You don't have to make it a goal. Just explore and then yes. watch what happens. You almost need to be more in that mindset of explore. Yeah, you have to explore. Because otherwise you're like in the minefield trying to force it into not being a minefield when it's already a minefield. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're intimating yourself going, I'm going to cross this minefield. I'm going to do it. 
here I go. And your mind's like, oh, you're going to die. <laughs> it's not going to work for you. Yeah, yeah. And you don't do that. Just explore it. Just explore it. And if you go with that mindset, when you start seeing the success, then you can start being a little more directed with your, with your approach. I hope you enjoyed this episode and found a new mindset to help you excel. In this case, I hope you found multiple mindsets to help you excel. For more information, please visit www.tamfpodcast.com forward slash mind. And please join me in any of the Tap and Move Forward social media to comment and let me know what you are learning or what you would like to learn in future episodes. 